Why did Russia invade Ukraine? It's no mystery. Russian dictator Vladimir Putin has told us many times himself. We see infrastructure of NATO right on, on our doorstep. We will be aiming at demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. In one of his latest historical outbursts, during an interview with American far-right commentator Tucker Carlson, Putin goes back more than a thousand years to justify his invasion of Ukraine. Between the weeds of historical myth and pure invention, Putin told us in no uncertain terms. I say that Ukrainians are part of the one <coughs> Russian people. They say, no, we are a separate people. Hundreds of millions of people watched the interview in which Putin, once again, claimed that modern Ukraine had no right to exist and therefore Russia's ongoing genocidal war was justified. While no historic land claim can legitimize aggression against sovereign territories, Putin's interpretation of history has very little to do with reality. I'm joined today by Jay McGlynn, a researcher, lecturer, linguist and a cultural historian specializing in modern Eastern Europe, particularly Russia under Vladimir Putin. She authored Russia's War and Memory Makers, focusing on Russia's war in Ukraine in 2014 and Russia's state-society relations, propaganda and memory politics. In this conversation, we'll sort out historical fact from fiction and understand how autocrats like Putin look thousands of years in the past to justify unspeakable violence in the present. Welcome, Jake. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. So I want to start right away with mm -hmm. the famous interview between Putin and Tucker Carlson. I mean, that interview sparked a lot of emotional reactions and comments. I mean, I felt like I was losing my mind when I was watching it. But how does an actual historian feel after watching something like that? For most historians, I would imagine it's an incredibly frustrating exercise. But I think for those of us who specialize in Russia, it was not a particularly surprising one. Because, I mean, you can actually go back to 1999 and 2000 and see, you know, pretty similar things. Of course, we're talking about history, but in many ways, what we're talking about is cultural memory. And in particular, in Vladimir Putin's case, the official state memory. And there's a difference between history and memory. History is the exercise of trying to find out what exactly happened. He's not interested in that. Um, of course, he would disagree, but ultimately he's not interested in that. He's interested in using the past to build a memory that unites the Russian nation and that unites it against others in a way that helps to legitimize his regime. And I think that's an important point that sometimes gets lost in the uh, debunking of, of his historical ramblings. I mean, it seems like he had a long time to be able to create that historical memory. I mean, he's been in power for decades. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's hard for people to remember anything else other than him continuing that exactly. explanation yes. of history or his explanation of history. Mm -hmm. I mean, Putin claimed that Russia's history started over a thousand years ago with Kiev and Rus, a Viking state that covered some of the modern territories of Ukraine, Russia and Belarus. Do you think Russia actually has a claim on those territories? No, and I mean, even if uh, Russia were the successor state, it's not, but even if Russia were the successor state to Kiev and Rus, that would have absolutely zero bearing on whether or not it has the right to those territories today, because, you know, there are inconvenient things like international law, territorial sovereignty, you know, recognized borders. But if we go back to the point, the idea of Russia as the heir to Kiev and Rus, this is very important. It was actually written into the constitution in 2020 when you had the constitutional amendment. So it's codified within the constitution. And it's very central to pretty much all of the, I think we can call it an ideology at this point that surrounds the Putin regime, not just him personally. The notion that Russia is a country that is inherently a great power, that is inherently um, a superior civilization. And this all links back to the idea that Russia is the inheritor of Kiev and Rus, which then gives its linkages back to Byzantium. Why this is such a political issue right now is because if Russia is the inheritor to Kiev and Rus, first of all, that means in, in their reading of history that Belarusians and Ukrainians and Russians are essentially just one people. Um, and we can see where some of those ideas have led us, unfortunately. And also, secondly, it leads us to the notion that Russia is, is somehow distinct and special and an and alternative civilization um, that derives almost a historical essence. And what's interesting is none of this begins with Putin. We can go back to Ivan Grozny, uh, to Ivan the Terrible, for example, 
And during his enthronement, he has, you know, Mongol caps, different elements like this, that he insists come back from Kievan Rus. And then after the time of troubles, of course, for the Romanov dynasty, the idea that they were descended from the Rurikovich um, line is very important to their legitimacy to the throne. So almost consistently, we see Russian leaders, with the exception of perhaps during the Soviet period, we see Russian leaders drawing on Volodymyr, of course, Prince Vladimir, or if you ask Danish people, Valdemar, um, you know, for this legitimacy to rule. And again, I think it takes us back to that importance that whoever is the heir of Kiev and Rus is sort of besides the point. The point is, why does Russia need to present itself as the heir? Um, because if Russia just wanted to pretend it was the heir to Kiev and Rus, well, that would be historically inaccurate, but it wouldn't really be causing it wouldn't really, yeah, exactly. The issue is what do they want to do with that? Why are they doing that? So when did Russia's history begin? I mean, that's a, that's a very tricky question. I think if we're talking about the Russian state in its current formation, of course, you could make an argument for 1991. Um, that would be Same the easiest, right? yeah, yeah, that would be the easiest one. Um, or if you want to talk, I suppose, in a more conceptual sense, then we could go back to Muscovy. Um, and the rise of Muscovy under the, um, the Mongol Empire. And I think that would be a much, it would be much easier to trace Russia's historical origins as a current state to Muscovy, uh, to Muscovy and the expansion of Muscovy by taking over neighboring principalities than it would be to trace it back to Kiev and Rus, with which Muscovy has very faint, um, has very faint historical links. That's not a thousand years ago, right? No, it's not a thousand years ago. No. Yeah, so that's kind of a, a, a bicycle that's been in writing for a while mm -hmm. and it's not really accurate. No, exactly. And it's such an important part. I mean, the idea of Russia as a, as a country with a thousand years of history, it also brings this idea of constancy and a historical essentialism that 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 appeals to many people in Russia because, of course, Russia has seen, you know, in a century, saw two state, two arguably free state collapses. Mm. Um, and so it provides this idea that there is a Russia that endures and that Putin is, I suppose, kind of the merely the newest um, incarnation of the leader of this, this Russia that endures. Well, Putin's main messages is that Ukraine as a state was artificially created. Mm -hmm. Are there any non-artificially created states? No, all states are artificial. I mean, Again, this comes back to that point, because if we think about Benedict Anderson's, you know, um, very important book in this area, Imagined Communities, his idea is that nations, they're imagined. That doesn't make them less real, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, people come up with different people who are united by a certain amount of factors, and that's different for each country. So in Britain, it might be something like traditions and history, but in America, it will be something more like ideas. You know, in some countries, Germany traditionally um, obviously, it had some very negative effects, but Germany traditionally has often been quite um, ethnicity-based, for example, or one's heritage. And the problem really for Russia is that it doesn't have this imagined community. It's never been about we the people. It never had nationalism. Unlike Ukraine, which went through the pretty standard European experience of nationalism that we saw in Central and Eastern Euro Europe sort of during the 1800s, during the 19th century and a bit before. Russia never had that. So instead of we the people or Respublika, you have he the ruler, the state. And that's a very different conception of the nation if you believe the nation is the state as opposed to believing that the nation is the people. And I think you see it today. People often ask me, oh, but so many people are dying or, you know, so many people have died. How is this not having any effect on whether or not people think that Russia is a great state? Because people think that Russia is a great state, not necessarily a great country to live in. You know, Russians are probably, presumably are not idiots. They can see it's not a great country to live in. But that's not how power or great power is measured um, in, in Russia and, and never really has been. So pretty much what you're saying that if Ukraine is an artificial state, as Putin says, then so is Russia. Yeah, of course. So is England. So is every, so is, I mean, Britain. Gosh, Britain's really very quite artificial. I mean, so 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 many countries, the United States, every single country is. And essentially, that's a pretty standard view among, uh, I wouldn't say academics, but I think most reasonable people that, that states are artificial constructs, um, doesn't make them less real, but they are, you know, imagined communities. But the type of nationalism or the understanding of the nation that we see in Russia, in, and not just in Putin, across his regime, across the education system, is one of historical essentialism. This idea that there is an essence of the nation, exactly, and that that is what makes a nation, and that Ukraine does not have this essence in, in his view or in, in that view.
which is for me so bizarre because it kind of goes fully against what we we're just you were just saying right now that you know Ukraine is a lot more nationalist and like in a way mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and has more of a people identity versus mm-hmm. the ruler identity. Mm-hmm. And I mean, often when Putin talks about Ukraine's artificial creation, mm-hmm. the Ukrainians' wills or opinions is not really never really addressed. Mm-hmm. So. Do Ukrainian people or even Russian people have any place in his revision of history? No, I mean, not much of one, to be honest. I mean, it's very interesting if you watch, there's a number of films. In 2012, it was the year of history, and there was a big effort to basically remake Russian popular culture um, with state-funded historical propaganda. And it's very interesting there to watch um, the depiction of Ukrainians in the sort of World War II films that they started to churn out because the Ukrainians are one of two people. They're either the bad idiots. Ukrainians. You, they're or, educated village idiots. Yeah, although they're the good Ukrainians yes. because they're the little brothers who know their place. Or you have the bad Ukrainians and they wear Vishivanki, they speak Ukrainian, you know, sometimes they have the Cossack um, mm. hairstyle and they're almost inevitably Nazi collaborators, you know, in their characterization. And so the Ukrainian people consistently since 2014, it's divided into good and bad. And what's so fascinating is the extent to which so many Russians in, within the regime, within the security services, lulled themselves to sleep on their own lullabies, if we translate the Russian phrase, because they genuinely did believe that they would be greeted as liberators and heroes in Kharkiv in so many of these places. By the good Ukrainians. Yes, by the good Ukrainians who were essentially Russian and genuinely were going... Were suffering yeah. from the hands of bad Ukrainians. Exactly, from the bad nationalists who <sighs> are... Ex- like that. Exactly, who are extremists and who are funded by the West. Mm. Um, so, I mean, the use of history, it's not just a legitimizing factor or a descriptive factor, it's actually a contributing factor um, because as this propaganda becomes ever more radical and as Russia's position in the world actually, or as Russia's position vis-a-vis Europe becomes ever more culturally insecure, the historical superiority, inferiority complex becomes ever more insistent and people are m- much more likely to cling to it. There's, it's gone so far now, it's very hard to just disentangle all of the propaganda. I think it's going to take a long, long time. And ultimately, I think it's something that can only happen when Russians are ready to do it um, themselves, I don't think it's something that can be imposed. You know, I mean, it's a lot easier to believe that you're the great saviors. Yeah, than yeah. That you're violent. Yeah, exactly. Violent sadists who are committing a genocide against people that you're supposed to think are your brothers. Mm-hmm. You know, exactly. And you have a lot of family ties yes, and exactly. history connected. Yeah, and, and that's why I think you do see this anger sometimes even among liberal Russians mm-hmm. about, you know, well, why are you resisting to Ukrainians? I mean, that's something that you will know better than me, Masha, but, you know, a lot of my Ukrainian friends with family in Russia have, have said, you know, that they said, look, oh, I don't know about the politics, but you just sit quietly and if you stop resisting, then... It will finish. Yeah, it will finish. And there's a perverse logic to it's it. It's a very abusive relationship. <laughs> it's very abusive. Yes, exactly. It's don't make me hit you. Yeah, victim blaming. Yeah. Do you really think Putin actually believes what he's saying? Like, does he actually not know Russia's or Ukraine's true history? Mm-hmm. If there's such a thing as true history? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, I think 100% he believes what he's saying. And I think one of the risks that many policymakers in the West have sort of made, or one of the mistakes, sorry, that they have made is to think that he doesn't mean it, that this is just something he says, and that instead what he means is the exact same thing that they would mean, you know, because he doesn't, the Russian political establishment does not work according to the same measures of rationality that IR scholars in the US work. Um, does not have the same conceptualization of security. For example, to give you just a very clear cut example, if we look at the Russian national security strategy, we can see that um, historical memory is mentioned 38 times, culture is mentioned, you know, 40 something times. Let's look at the American equivalent. Obviously, there's no reference to historical memory and there's one reference to culture and it's to agriculture. And I think it just shows the chasm in the understanding of security and the understanding of how important these historical narratives are almost to Russia's ontology, its sense of itself, its sense of being one. That doesn't mean we should respect it, but we need to understand it in order to be able to to appreciate uh, the regime's motivations um, in Ukraine. And ultimately, I think, because if we, if we look at what Putin has said about Ukraine, you know, even if we only go back to 2014, 
there's plenty of evidence that this is not going to be solved by just giving him a little bit more of Ukrainian land. This is about a war to reshape the global order. And in Russia's view, it, need, it has the right and also it has the need. What doing is not significant. It's, not an, it's nothing real in his mm -hmm. view. So he's allowed to do whatever he wants because exactly. he has a historical claim. Yes, exactly. He's fully, it seems like he feels justified to be doing what he's doing. Mm -hmm. because he read a lot of files over COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, pretty much. And because Russia is a great state and Ukraine is a colony, it will therefore either be a colony of the West, mm -hmm. which he doesn't want, or it will be a colony of Russia, which he does want. So I think, obviously, the questions that you're giving me, because you, you're Ukrainian and these are much um, more in-depth questions that start from a much higher foundation of understanding but often i find in the west when i'm asked questions i can just answer them with putin's own comments own quotations because it's very easy you can just find what he says i think the bigger problem is that many even many russia specialists in the west do not have a great command of russian mm -hmm. um and that also people just choose not to read him and choose instead to pretend there's some general theory that explains you know the actions of states the actions of mankind and I mean, I would love a theory that explains even how I act. <laughs> so it's, it, human beings are unpredictable. Human beings have their weaknesses and nobody acts rationally. There's always emotional identity elements. And really this whole conversation around historical memory, it's not about truth. It's about identity. It's about ident And that's why it's so emotional and so hard to, to overcome. Why are dictators so obsessed with history? Like why is that their tool that they use to create their narratives? I think for a large part, it's a question of legitimacy because obviously dictators are unable to go, well, they're not unable to, they choose not to go to the people. They are unable to derive popular legitimacy. For a long time in the Kremlin and even still now, there was a very careful management of society and opinion polls to ensure that Putin remained a popular dictator because it's much easier to be a popular dictator, right? No, but it is because no, otherwise know, you have know, to know, spend a lot of money. Horrible. Yeah, <laughs> but I think even now we can probably talk about Putin as a popular dictator. That's one element. But after all, then you have two points. One is if you can look to history, then it gives you some legitimacy to your rule, like we were talking about with the Romanovs, like we were talking about with Ivan Grozny. But also um, if you look to say somebody like Putin, who has been in power for a very long time, Anybody is going to go a bit mad if they've been in power for that long. I mean, even in a democratic society, um, I wouldn't have voted for her anyway, but many people point to the example of Margaret Thatcher, who just completely lost all sense and, you know, started to behave like a monarch. Um, and for Putin, one of the things that came up a lot in my interview, say, for example, with people like Fyodor Lukyanov, who's obviously very close to that side of the Kremlin, was that Putin is very worried about his historical legacy. And he wants to resolve, in his words, the Ukraine question. Ukraine um, race is the great solver. The reuniter, the yeah, the reuniter, reunifier of Russian lands, of the Russian people who were left outside of the borders. So there's also this kind of um, grandiosity yeah. that comes with being a dictator, plus the legitimacy issue. In many people in power, as you just said yourself, have distorted and weaponized history. So what, what is the difference, I guess, uniqueness in Russia's distortion of history? So, I mean, I, I'm not sure even if I would use the word uniqueness, but I think there are two elements. So one of them is the intensity of it. It's just simply more intense. In Britain, we often use World War II analogies mm -hmm. too much, in my view. But the idea that you could send your child to a summer camp where they could learn how to do historical information, or historical disinformation blogging, uh, over the summer is a step too far, but that's something you can do at the Strana Geroyev set of, of um, summer camps in Russia, just to give one very small example. The second uh, difference is the extent to which there is what I call historical framing. So this consistent use of historical analogies that, you know, exactly so you can understand the part, uh, you understand the present through the past. Of course, we all use analogies. We all use historical analogies. They're very effective. Um, unfortunately, they anchor very quickly, so they're very effective in propaganda. But the, I, the way in which constantly history is applied, almost like an ideology, almost like this is the view of history. And if you apply it to today, we can see that, oh, we are the good guys again, and we're fighting Nazis. And that then, of course, 
writes off a lot of Russia's sins because, of course, it's terrible. You, you know, people can tell themselves, well, it's terrible that we're bombing, but think how many of us the Nazis killed and now we're bombing Nazis. You know, it makes it, it's just another way to yeah. put more on the menu to make the war acceptable or even, um, yeah, to, to ordinary people, to ordinary Russians. That actually brings me to one of the later questions, but it really, I was wondering what you think about it in the same interview with Tucker Carlson, Putin, you know, justified Nazis invasion of Poland, but at the same time, of course, seeing Nazis invasion of Soviet Union as an aggression. Mm -hmm. So is this inconsistency purposeful? Mm -hmm. And if yes, then why? Why to jump back and forth? So this, in a way, is a very different to very different approach to memory and history that we might see in the what we can call the liberal memory paradigm, where you look at what's happened in the past, and if you've done something wrong, you go and you say sorry for it, and you make amends, you face up to what you did, and then everything becomes better. With Germany being, I suppose, the sort of poster child of, of that um, coming to terms with the past. But in Russia and in many other countries and in many other societies, including in Germany, you have, I suppose, what we might call an illiberal memory paradigm, which is not that it's anti-liberal, but it's post-liberal in mm -hmm. the sense that these societies have experienced some liberalism and either these societies or these sections of society have rejected it. They, um, they feel that their needs on different levels are unmet by liberalism, by the particularly mm -hmm. globalized form of liberalism. What relevance does that have to memory? Well, what we see with a liberal memory in Russia, in Hungary, in many other countries is this attempt to try to get back to a lost state, get back to something that was lost, something that liberalism tried to destroy. And therefore their use of history doesn't need to be linear mm. because you're just trying to restore the good bits of the past. So you can pick and choose. choose, exactly. And of course, the other issue is that this is, again, this is not about truth. This really is about identity. And here I would quote Vladimir Medinsky, who was the ghostwriter for Putin's On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians, that sometimes myths are truer than facts. The history that's important to Putin is history that doesn't accuse Russia of anything bad and in which Russia is a hero, or if something tragic happens to Russia, it's not the fault of Russians, it's the fault of some you know, external bad actor, probably the Anglo-Saxi. Mm -hmm. And that's what he needs, that's how he makes his historical arguments, mm -hmm. and that's how they are logical to him. So the idea that it's inconsistent sometimes is not really important. It's not, that's a big difference, I think, with the Soviet Union, is that there's no attempt really about to engage in empiricism. Um, so if we think about like the efforts that Brezhnev went to and, the, and like the apparatchiks under Brezhnev to hide the fact that the 28 Pamphilovs see some of them were still alive and that the legend was untrue, but that still shows a certain amount of respect for you know <laughs> empirical truth. At least you know you have to hide it. Um, Here you're just like, no, I like this part of history. Yes, yeah. And that, that one we're just not gonna mention. People read my history anyway. Yeah. They don't really know what happened. Exactly, exactly. It's an entirely different conceptualization of, of truth. So do you think Putin is succeeding in his distortion of history? Depends what you mean. I think if we're talking about the Tucker Carlson interview, then that was a definite negative for him because it was so intense. Do you think he's su succeeding in persuading people in Russia and in the West that Russia actually has a legitimate claim on Ukraine? Yes, I think that unfortunately some of it does, but not because of interviews like that, but I think because of much more like the cultural propaganda in particular around Crimea. And I think in different countries, it works in different ways. So for example, in America, it seems to me, I'd be interested in your thoughts, that the idea of Russia has a right to Ukraine because Russia is a great power, that has a lot more um, resonance than, whereas in the UK, the idea of Crimea and the idea of Kiev is the first capital of Russia, which is a statement that has been said to me a few times and that I cry every time by very intelligent people as well, which is sad. Do you think that's connected to the Kiev and Rus? Like, yes, is it yes, just a yes, exactly. It is. Kiev and Rus. Exactly. So that's exactly the capital. Mm -hmm. And then the Russia is the Rus, which is, exactly. I know that's, I've been, I've heard it before where people said that that's actually a big issue, mm -hmm. that Russia's claim on the Rus part, because then a lot of people, when you translate from English 
you know, Rus, Russian kind of sounds the same. Yeah, yeah, it does sound the same. I mean, it's funny because we were having a discussion about this yesterday and whether or not it would be better to transliterate Russia as a Russia, mm, uh, because obviously, so yeah, um, because that would that is his actual name oh. in Russian. But I don't know. I mean, part of, I have a lot of sympathy towards the argument, but on the other hand, part of me thinks these are maybe efforts that would be better spent towards just getting more ammunition. I guess most countries use mythologized, mm. you know, history to create national identity. But at what point did Russia move from, you know, just historical obsession to actual violence? So I think um, the road for this became, was laid in 2012 when you had that year of history, when you had the foundation of the Russiske Vajene Istorijska Obstva and the Russiske Istorijska Obstva, which first of which is headed by Vladimir Medinsky and the second of which is headed by Sergei Narishkin, who is the head of the equivalent of the CIA, so of the SVR which again says a lot because you could not imagine saying that statement in America, yeah. even, even now with America's sports festival. So um, that's one aspect, but I mean, this functions all around. And even if we look, let's say, at the, the temporarily occupied territories, I mean, what have been their priorities in Melitopol to build a new Russia Maya Historia exhibition? Um, so, a his, you know, in order to impose this view of history, to burn Ukrainian books, to bring in Russian history books, they understand the importance of this because He's you... Ukrainians from their actual Exactly, from who they really are. And the most, like, obscene and horrific example of that is the, is the deportation of the children, of the orphans. And, yes, exactly. Um, so we see all of these different elements. When did it become so militarized? I think it was always militarized. I think there was always it was always there in society. When I did research uh, fieldwork in Russia from sort of 2015 to 2018 with people who had set up these military history clubs for children, a lot of them, they had set them up on their own account and it was based on their own Soviet experiences just to create something for the kids to do. Then the state became involved and encouraged it further, you know, through funding, etc. and so on. But very certain is, you know, we're going to keep the children of the streets and just teach them how to use weapon instead. Yeah, I mean, the military history clubs, they're not the same as military patriotic clubs. They don't always have like that element of, you you know, like you and which is, yeah. a, you know, a terrifying uh, apparition. But um, the military history clubs, they're still basically about almost like dressing up as Red Army soldiers, um, learning about what your great grandfather or your grandfather did in World War Two, and, and these this sort of identity element connection. So there's a bit of war playing, but it's it's less intense. Um, but yeah, a lot of that came from society. And then in 2014, with the Revolution of Dignity, that's really I mean that's when I began to research it. That's how I became an academic because I was just so fascinated. I lived in Moscow and ev and I only had Russian television, and it was just so f fascinating to watch it and just be like wow, why have they gone off for 45 minutes about the OON UPA? You know, what relevance does that have to what's happening today? And, but also seeing how it worked. It worked even on friends who were anti-Putin and then the hysteria, the mass hysteria and support for the annexation of Crimea. I, it felt like this was a genie that might not go back in the bottle. And even though it did go back in the bottle slightly for a while, um, it, it didn't last. So from what you're saying, does it, can we say like it all started at least in 2012, like that was them laying groundwork to prepare the society for all of these next actions that are violent and, you know, quite aggressive. I mean, I think, yes, if we want to be more specific, but you could also look at 2007, the Munich speech, the, the Federal Assembly address. Um, you could, and a lot of the projects that were launched in 2012 were actually set up in mm -hmm. 2007, 2008, but they just, nothing happened with them. Mm -hmm. Or you'd look at 2004, the Orange Revolution. There was a lot of what we see in the propaganda in 2014, essentially was developed in 2004. The American consultants actually to Yanukovych were particularly keen in pushing the use of the Second World War of the Great Patriotic War as a kind of political tool. Um, or you could go further back to 1991 and looking at things like Sovietska Ukraina, the newspaper, which also talked about the idea of an independent Ukraine as essentially like you know, Banderistan sort of idea um, and and throughout history. So in some ways it starts wherever Ukraine wants to exist, mm. which is why it really can't, um, unless you believe that Ukraine shouldn't exist, which is obviously not a reasonable position from the vast, vast majority of people. Oh, you say Yes. Um, really none of this, and by this I mean like this awful war, none of it gets solved in Ukraine or through discussions of who's the inheritor of Kiev and Rus. It gets solved in 
in in Russia's conception of itself and its role in the world, which which needs to be drastically different. And until that point, we need to work out a way to stop it from acting on its desires. I know that some historians believe that debunking Russia propaganda only helps it to set the agenda instead of focusing on researching actual history where world's biggest minds are just constantly have to answer the crazy claims from Putin or, you know, other Russian. It's a difficult one. I don't think there's a perfect answer to it because if somebody is putting these claims out on a very large stage that has a you know very large reach, you do have to respond to it if it's a lie. If somebody's telling a lie about you, you're going to want to respond to it and explain, no, this is a lie here. However, at the same point, I would suggest that not too much attention should be spent on it because, of course, you are then legitimizing it a bit. I think you earlier, you know, used the example of if you have to if you set out ten reasons why you know the world isn't flat then at some point you give some legitimacy to the concept that the, that the earth is flat. Yeah, um, or could be. Yeah, or could be. That it's at least a view worth entertaining and spending time discussing. So it's a, it's a difficult one. I think sometimes what I would like to see would be perhaps um, like a useful website maybe that debunked, that could, could be shared, you know, around media that just debunked certain facts. And also I think but more... Providing- that like actual history instead of answering yes exactly and uh, yeah kind of go before it and yeah explain it or encourage people to explore the history themselves because history is so rarely clear cut um you know and i think especially of this area yes exactly well especially of this area and of this era that's so long ago i mean we really have what like a few chronicles of kiev and rus and we have no idea to the extent to which you know the monks who are writing about it were influenced by you know power exactly yes exactly so i mean the idea that that it's easy to just that we can just find okay well this is true and this is not no and i think it's helpful for people to engage especially in this world that's become so polarized it's helpful for people to engage with the nuance of like you know what we can't know and also it's actually just not really that it's okay to have a clear-cut answer yeah very often i feel like clear-cut answers it's a good sign that it's not a really good answer. Exactly, I agree. And also because that's not where legitimacy comes from. It doesn't matter even if Russia's, you know, the 100% unproven, If even if Putin has all of the historical documents, he doesn't. But, you know, to show that Russia is the number one heir of Kiev and Rus, that doesn't give him any right to come and kill Ukrainians and for his soldiers to come and rape Ukrainians and to steal their children and to conquer the country because that's not where legitimacy comes from. How does the world resist propaganda? How... How should history be taught? It depends on which audiences we're talking about. We know that media literacy, historical literacy, and so on, that can make a really big difference in democratic or at least partly democratic societies. However, in authoritarian societies, it actually has the opposite effect because it makes people think, oh, I can never know the truth and to feel overwhelmed and as if they can't ever really work out what's true. And so they should just kind of go with what feels right instinctively, which is something that's been molded by propaganda, popular culture, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think differentiating, focusing on your audience, but yeah, media literacy, historical literacy, encouraging people to not have black and white views. Um, I think that the polarization on all sides is very dangerous. Um, and, and, and that I think is probably the best thing I can come up with. Thank you so much. Thank you. And yeah, I just, I really enjoy talking to you and yeah, thanks for making me feel a bit more sane after watching that interview <laughs> because I definitely was breathing my hair out. If you would like to know more about Ukraine's history and how Russia has been distorting it for centuries, make sure to watch our series of explainers, Ukraine's True History.